Hello, everyone. Welcome to this ERI Northern California chapter webinar on the December 29th Croatia earthquake. I'm Maggie Ortiz Milan, program manager at EERI. I'll be saying a few words before handing things over to today's moderators. First, I would like to quickly go over a few logistics. You can choose to listen to the webinar through your computer or your phone in the control panel. There will be time for questions at the end of the webinar. During the presentation, please submit your questions or comments in the questions panel. The recording from today's webinar will be posted on EERI's YouTube channel and presentation slides will be posted on the Learning from Earthquakes website. For those who may not be familiar with EERI, I want to say a little bit. The Earthquake Engineering Research Institute is the leading nonprofit membership organization connecting people dedicated to reducing earthquake risk. By joining EERI, you become a member of our global network and gain access to the resources and connections you need to succeed and to make an impact. Now I'll hand it over to Vulcan Sevigan, president of the EERI Northern California chapter. Vulcan. Thank you, Maggie. Hi, everyone. I would like to welcome you to our event. Our chapter is dedicated to reducing earthquake risks. And this year, we started this new program quick quick briefings to better collaborate with our international colleagues to learn from them and apply those knowledge to reduce our joint global earthquake risks um, to introduce the speakers i would like to now hand the microphone virtual microphone to bruce mason our uh, chapter secretary and treasurer and he's going to introduce our great speakers today. Thank you, Volcan. Uh, I first would like to welcome all the audience to our quick quake briefing on the Croatian earthquake of December 29. I am a board member of the Northern California chapter of EERI, and I'll serve as the moderator today. You might recall we had a webinar in November that dealt with the 5.3 earthquake that happened in Croatia. This earthquake we'll be talking about today occurred within one year and it's in the same general area. Also, before we get started, I want to mention, as Vulcan did, that we plan to have more so-called quick quake briefings shortly after earthquakes that occur anywhere in the world. And we're already looking at a quick quake briefing for later this month on the Indonesian earthquake that happened on January 15th. That was a magnitude 6.2 and it killed over 40 people. So stay tuned. Back to today's talk. The magnitude 6.4 earthquake on December 29th was, uh, the epicenter was about 30 miles southeast of the capital of Croatia, Zagreb. It affected thousands of people and there were some fatalities. Today, we're gonna to have two speakers that have on the ground experience from doing damage assessments shortly after the earthquake. Now, the format for today's meeting is this. Our presenters today will speak for about 30 minutes. Then we will have a 15 minute question and answer session. Now, as mentioned previously, the audience members, you will type in your questions in the question box, and then behind the scenes, Volcan will sort through the questions. He will select several, and then he will ask those of our speakers today. So I'd like to introduce our speakers today, and they are joining us from Europe, and it's about nine o'clock in the evening there, whereas it is about 12 noon here in California. Our first speaker today is Ninad Bielic. He is a researcher at the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology. He has a doctorate in structural engineering from Stanford University in California. Our second speaker is Marco Bartalek. He is a professor of structural engineering at the University of Zagreb in Croatia. He has a doctorate in structural engineering from the University of Zagreb. Both of our speakers today are involved with the EERI Learning from Earthquakes effort, and they've participated in a report about this earthquake that is now available. 
So what I would like to do now is warmly welcome our first speaker, Nidad. Nidad, please continue. Yeah, thank you, Bruce, um, for the kind introduction. Hi, everyone. My name is Nenad, and it's really a pleasure that I can present to you today, um, together with Marco, some of the experiences that we've gathered in observations after, uh, during the reconnaissance after the uh, magnitude 6.4 earthquake that happened on December 29th in a uh, little town south of Zagreb. The town is called Petunia. And, you know, while um, Mark and I are, you know, the faces of this presentation, I just want to acknowledge immediately that um, the presentation is based on a report um, that was put together uh, as a joint effort between the ERI Learning from Earthquakes program and STEER. Um, and um, this report kind of outlines um, the reconnaissance effort. Um, it's a, you know, it was a really tremendous effort and kind of service that uh, really devoted and driven a group of um, talented individuals uh, has put together in a really short amount of time. The report was made in essentially seven days. Um, and um, it, it goes quite in depth in the observations. Um, about the earthquake and the presentation is largely based on this so in that way all of the authors that are listed here are also authors of the presentation um, what marco and i will try doing though as we were the members of the field um, reconnaissance team um, we're going to try to give you our perspective and kind of complementary to what the report provides so for more information you can always um, get, you know refer to the document um, Additionally, before I get started, um, I just want to make a full acknowledgement and kind of say a huge thank you to the Croatian Center for Earthquake Engineering. Um, they have provided, you know, tremendous uh, logistic support and, you know, emotional support throughout um, our reconnaissance effort. And, you know, as Bruce mentioned, like 2020 in Croatia was marked by two really significant earthquakes, one in March and one at the end in December. And if there's anything you know positive that came out of these, you know, you know, silver lining in the Croatian earthquake sequence plan, uh, it's the formation of the Croatian Center for Earthquake Engineering, uh, which started largely as a volunteering effort of a uh, really devoted uh, group of people that had been advocating for seismic resilience and safety in Croatia for a number of years, um, and, and you know, they put together a volunteering effort um, and organized. Um, group of people in a system to perform um yes post earthquake safety evaluation to get critical um you know information and kind of support to the affected um, regions um, this is a, a volunteering effort uh, most of them are associated with the faculty of civil engineering at the university of zagreb and it's really also important to stress that the university supports this uh, effort you know uh, in every possible way, which is important, um, kind of to understand the importance of uh, uh, seismic resilience. Um, no, not but sorry, yeah. sorry, sorry to interrupt. We don't see your slides. We see a blank slide. Oh no, I can yeah. Flip the next slide. So, so as I say, you know, there's a report that we put together, um, and um, there you go. And and this is the report. Um, and you know next slide will show um, all the authors that participated which i said you know would be the authors of this presentation um, as well uh, the next slide kind of acknowledges the creation center for earthquake engineering and the key individuals um, that um, kind of started that effort in doing um, seismic safety uh, evaluations after the earthquake uh, but it's um, ultimately you know the the the, the effort that they put together involves a huge number of volunteers that are doing evaluations. And while I can't, um, you know, name each and every one, we can acknowledge, we can show you their photos because one of the logos actually has um, all the, uh, you know, little uh, uh, photos of the volunteers. Uh, and so I just want to say, you know, tremendous thank you for all the service that you guys are doing. Um, for the people in the affected areas. Now, to get started with the presentation, our roadmap will be as follows. We'll have, you know, first uh, a view of the kind of um, the setting and the seismicity of the region. Um, we'll then, uh, we'll follow that by a walk through the epicenter, um, which um, will focus on structural aspects 
uh, and then um, finally we'll wrap it up by discussing you know geotag um, aspects um, so to get us started uh, with the um, setting and seismicity so Croatia is you know located in Europe it's part of the EU since uh, 2013 and one of them you know this presentation will show a lot of disturbing photos in the sense of damage and destruction but Croatia is really ultimately a beautiful country with lovely people and I'm showing this photo of a national park so just keep this as you know an emotional anchor as we go through the photos uh, you know just in case you need uh, this um, so in terms of um, uh, the setting as I said Croatia is this boomerang shaped country right across from Italy at Adriatic in terms of population is about one-tenth of California and area-wise about one-seventh um, the capital is Zagreb and as Bruce mentioned two earthquakes happened um, in 2020 in Croatia there was a March event in Zagreb in capital and then the December event um, in Petrinja uh, both of these earthquakes are um, documented uh, they have their, you know, ERI learning from earthquake web pages, um, and specifically the Zagreb one. Um, we will not discuss today, though. But as Bruce mentioned again, there's a, um, a webinar devoted to that that was uh, done a couple of, uh, months ago. Uh, again, as part of the Northern California um, chapter, um, so you can refer to these, uh, you know, for additional um, information. Now, moving forward with the um the present earthquake um the main shock happened on december 29th but one of the um uh, you know kind of interesting uh, um, things that happened in this case is that this was preceded by two four shocks uh, right the day before so on december 28th um, so there was a magnitude 5.2 event and a magnitude 4.7 event and um uh, what we aim to do throughout the presentation is also to show you, you know, the state of some of the buildings after the four shocks and then after the main shock event as it as it happened. Um, so moving forward, um, yeah, the situation in terms of seismicity in Croatia, though, is rather complex and there's a huge wealth of data that was produced by you know local seismologists in terms of research over the years um, so i'll just report or refer you to the, the report and kind of references therein in terms of um you know getting information about that but the area we'll zoom in on um today is this pokopskopetina seismic zone and one of the you know past events that was really you know important for that region is the 1909 event that happened in um, Kupa Valley so this event of last year's kind of made perhaps a repeat of that event um, and this event is important for two reasons first one of the important reasons is this guy uh, Andrea Mohorovic who's also known as the Moho guy because uh, he based on the uh, measurements uh, of seismic waves from that event essentially you know formulated the moho discontinuity thing that we know today and then the second importance of this event for croatia is that it governs the hazard or severely impacts the hazard uh, in that region and talking about hazard um, just to get an insight um, what we're showing on this slide is the uniform hazard spectra for um, petrinja and zagreb um, and overlaid with that are um, yeah, hazard curve the UHS spectra or you know 10 and 50 return period uh, intensity um, uh, uh, that for some of the cities in um, California so for instance um, if you click next slide um, it'll show Zagreb yeah no go back <laughs> so yeah and so you can see that Petunia and Zagreb have you know current estimates of hazard they're fairly different. Betania is kind of in shorter periods similar to Sacramento whereas Zagreb is um, kind of like San Diego shorter period and for instance uh, Napa has a larger hazard than both of these sites. Um, and so with that we can move into our walk through the epicenter uh, kind of um, starting off with structural aspects um, of um, and the way we'll do it uh, you know this, this is a map from the report and the report is very systematic but we'll do it a little as if we're walking through the epicenter so we'll start our walk where this red arrow points which um, is on the next slide 
yeah, which is the um, uh, the high school in downtown Petrinja, which consists of, of the main building and an annex which houses a sports hall. Now the um, the main building is a URM kind of built around you know 1800s, and one of the things. Um, uh, to note is that you know the facade looks amazing, at least it did uh, before the earthquake, um, and, and that's one of the observations that you know was made that a lot of the funds and kind of uh, investments went into uh, you know architectural uh, kind of improvements, but on the structural side, strengthening and retrofit that wasn't that unfortunately wasn't um, uh, superly pursued. Uh, so what you can see on this slide is the um, the same view of the building, but uh, you can notice a, a severe shear crack on the outside of the wall. Um, and but we'll also show on the next slides um, kind of how the inside of the building looks. So the next slide shows the photo of the inside after the foreshock. So this was the 5.2 event on December 28, um, and you can see you know little to no damage and contrast that to one day later after a magnitude 6.4 event. Now, instead of showing you a lot of photos, we'll just show you a video on the next slide, which we took while uh, you know walking through the, uh, through the building. And as you're looking at these photos, I mean, the video may be a bit choppy, but uh, uh, you'll notice different types of damage and destruction. I'll just make a personal comment about how it was actually recording these videos. Um, and interacting uh, with the you know virtual team that we had online all the time. So so the comments we would get, we, you know, we would record and send to our team, and then it would say some would say, you know, okay, this is great, but you know, be careful because you know this is really dangerous. You got to keep in mind the weather was cloudy with aftershocks. So in that sense, you know, it's not really you know prudent to spend too much time in this type of um, damaged buildings. But and then the other team's members would say, which is you know arguably also valid argument, is that they would say, well, well this is great, but could you walk slower and kind of move the camera slowly so that we can get better photos? Uh, which is you know uh, we and we improved on that. Like later on, we would you know walk fast but move camera slower and so forth. Um, but yeah, it, 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 you, as you can see, that the building was severely damaged, and you'll see now that there's also damage to piping and kind of water leaking in the lab which we'll walk into right now. And so you'll see this uh, kind of, you see the water on the floor and uh, you'll see the pipe leaking here. Um, but yeah, we can move to the next slide. We'll show you the, the video of the, of the sports hall. Now, the sports hall was in the annex of the building. And, and you know, one of the questions the principal had is whether they can use the sports hall to house, you know, people that were affected by their earthquake that lost their houses. And so we did um, the um, kind of the evaluation of the sports hall for that purpose. Uh, and it was it consists out of a you know precast reinforced um, concrete frame. Um, and one thing you know, that was real, which you'll see right now as we turn. Um, and, uh, and I'll tell you, Marco, when to pause. You'll notice severe damage in the joints. Um, the frames. So, um, and so based on that, unfortunately, the sports hall, you can pause right now. Um, so you can see it uh, kind of up there. Um, so the sports hall wasn't uh, unfortunately usable for that purpose. Okay. And that's, you know, that part of the street. So we can move on with the next slide, um, uh, which will show a map and we were where we are right now. And if we turn on the other end of this, like other side of the same place, um, on the next slide, you'll see that there's a supermarket at that location, which is a fairly newer building. And the next slide, um, it points to the older URM building right next to it. Um, and so on the next slide, I'll show you how the URM looked after the foreshock on December 28th. Um, and then following photo shows the same building after the main shock. Um, and, you know, this is a URM with flexible diagram, wooden roof. Um, and you can see that, so click, you can see the collapse, part of it collapsed onto the supermarket. But what is kind of interesting is that there's an actually a surveillance cam right underneath where the building kind of collapsed onto that. So on the next slide, we'll show you the, the video from the surveillance cam that was taken from that spot as indicated on the, on the supermarket. And what you'll notice is that on the left end of the 
cam of the video, there'll be a guy that after the shaking starts, he'll start running right past the, the umbrella uh, and, and you'll see what happens then. Um, so the shaking will start soon. Um, you see people running, there's a dog coming that way, but hopefully he you know, stops and the wall collapses. Um, and you know, it's these types of things you learn as you walk through the affected areas and talk to people that provide information to you. Uh, the structure itself was not, you know, it was a, it's a steel frame, so it wasn't damaged, but as you can see on these photos, so um, there's a severe, uh, you know, damage to content uh, losses in that sense. Um, and, and you know the set. You know this is how the downtown was really, really, you know, strongly affected. As you can see, a view uh, from this street. Um, on the next slide, you'll see how it looked uh, before the earthquake, and, and then yeah, um, this is how it looked uh, after the main event. Um, some of the buildings, though, uh, performed well, and a couple of meters next to it as the arrow is pointing is a church that was actually um, well the church was built in the 19th century but it was um, uh, severely damaged in the war in the 90s and it was rebuilt in early you know mid 2000s um, and as you know this rc uh, building with uh, confined masonry and essentially did fine except for the few um, tiles that went you know flying um, and you know, just to wrap up this downtown, we'll sh rather than showing you a lot of these photos, we'll just show you a video of our drive through the street that the red arrow is pointing to, um, and, and to just you know get an idea how the the setting looked. Um, and you know, this is a couple of days after the earthquake, so most of the rubble has been cleared away and um, streets were you know really passable. Uh, but the uh, you know the downtown center wasn't blocked up yet, um, and as you're looking at this, um, I mean you'll notice the type of damage and kind of what I'll just make a comment about is why this type of an event was really in impactful and uh, you know troubling for people there, not just in its own right, but um, you got to keep in mind that this was a an area that was severely affected by the war, so a lot of these people actually went through you know this type of destruction before and they you know left their houses and didn't know whether they can return and so this type of an event just kind of opens up these wounds again even though it's 20 years later um, and so that is just very psychologically taxing um, for you know all these people i mean it was for us when we were just doing reconnaissance it's it's not easy uh, seeing these things um, so yeah well, this ride will now end and uh, then Mar marco will continue um, with, you know, the, the remaining part. Okay, thank you, Nenad. Um, hello to everybody. Uh, thanks again to the ERI team for having us uh, as their uh, presenters. Uh, I will uh, I will show you that now a map. So uh, the red uh, rectangle presents uh, the area that Nenad talked about and. Um, the, the part where uh, this uh, ride that we just saw ends, it's, it's here. So we are going to move uh, for about 300 meters away from that point now. And we're going to observe um, uh, two buildings on our next location. Uh, the two buildings are um, uh, faculty of education and one uh, elementary school. Uh, these buildings are uh, relatively new, let's say. Uh, so let's uh, let's have a look. So uh, first, uh, I'm going to talk about shortly about Faculty of Education. It's a building um, that was built in the 1960s. Uh, it consists out of two segments. So we see the lower segment with only ground floor and the uh, higher segment with um, uh, three three stories. Uh, this building has uh, RC. Uh, columns on most of the outer walls, but uh, inside it's only uh, masonry uh, walls. So uh, that was uh, obviously a huge problem for the behavior of the structure. Uh, we noticed um, severe damage on the inside, both on load-bearing walls and non-load-bearing walls. 
um, staircases basically, basically on, on uh, all the elements. Uh, I have to point out that on this uh, uh, top uh, right uh, picture, the building looks quite good. Uh, it's because it has been recently performed, uh, recently uh, renewed in terms of um, energy efficiency, so thermal insulation. But as Nana uh, already told you, uh, uh, as in case of many buildings in Croatia, uh, no seismic strengthening was uh, performed. So this is a typical case in many public uh, buildings in our country, like schools or hospitals. And now we see some consequences of, of this procedure. So from the outside, the building looks uh, pretty good. I mean, you, you don't notice anything, basically. Um, also, uh, we want to show you an example um, of, uh, of um, a wall that we noticed. It had a, a possible out-of-plane failure mode, so we decided to label it and uh, restrict the, the access in that area. You can see the, the, the picture inside, so there are a lot of, lot of damage. Also, we noticed a lot of overturned shelves and uh, fallen items in the building uh, in basically all the offices and uh, the class, classrooms. Uh, but also we saw a good example in, um, in the library of sufficient uh, anchorage. It, it, it was very good and, and nice to see that. But um, unfortunately, we also saw a total collapse of the ceiling assembly in one of the classrooms. Uh, and and in, that, in this case, this particular case, uh, it, it's actually good that because of COVID, you know, uh, students were not present uh, in, in the building because we had a lockdown and uh, the class were held um, online. Uh, moving from this building to, to our next building. So this is elementary school uh, just across the street. Um, Talking about elementary schools, I, I would uh, I will also present uh, one another elementary school, uh, Mato Lorac. It's um, about one kilometer from uh, elementary school, Dragut Tadianami. So I will cover them uh, both as as a whole. Uh, the elementary school, Dragut Tadianami, which was built in the 1970s, uh, its structure is RC moment resisting frames with masonry infill walls. Uh, it performed uh, very good. Uh, we can see on this picture that uh, most of the damage we have observed are uh, were cracks at the intersection uh, of the masonry infill and the RC frame. So the, the load bearing capacity of the structure um, was, was not in danger. Uh, this building also has an annex uh, sports hall with uh, RC frames with infill walls and steel joists uh, roof structure. It performed quite good, um, unlike the, the, the sports hall that we, uh, we already saw in Nenad's part. Uh, this um, sports hall performed quite good. There were some minor cracks observed in the supports area, but nothing to be uh, worried about, so nothing critical. Uh, moving to, to the other elementary school, Mato Lorac, uh, when we zoom in on, on that particular school, uh, we notice that it has been um, uh, uh, built over the years in a couple of segments. So it has uh, this lower part, it's timber structure. Uh, the middle part is a steel structure, the connection between the, the new and the old building, and the uh, new building is RC structure. Uh, all of them performed quite good, uh, although they only have two stories, but uh, they all performed very good. Uh, when we see at, at these uh, pictures, so it's, um, it's a picture of the RC structure uh, part of the building. Uh, we did not notice uh, basically any damage on concrete uh, walls or, um, or beams or columns. Uh, we can see here the, the, the fallen Christmas tree, but the structure remained uh, practically un, untouched. Uh, the same situation happened with the timber structures. So in the lower part of, of the building, this is the main uh, corridor uh, in, the, uh, in 
this part of the building. As you can see, it looks very good. You know, the roof structure, everything performed very well. Uh, the only problem with the building is the, is the chimney, um, which had uh, severe cracks. And uh, that's why it, it actually puts in danger the half of the building of the school and uh, the, the school cannot be used for, for, that, for, for its purpose because of that. Okay, so we now made a walk uh, through the epicenter and now we are moving a bit, um, a bit further away. So we will walk around the epicenter. We're going to uh, Sisak. Sisak is a city uh, located approximately seven kilometers northeast from Petrinja. And we are going to uh, have a look at the uh, Sisak uh, Hospital, General Hospital. Um, this is the, the, the hospital complex. Uh, we have uh, some more details in the report. I won't be uh, too much in details here. Uh, the main thing is that the complex consists of buildings of different age and different structure type. This is a typical situation in Croatia. Um, so I just labeled a couple of uh, important buildings that have patients inside or administration and um, have them labeled in this manner. So after the quake, they only have uh, had one uh, building that was operational for patients. So they had to set up uh, tents, army tents in the, in the hospital. Um, the yellow tag building was partially operational, so uh, it had uh, two floors that uh, that were operational and the two floors that were not because of the damage that was severe. Uh, two buildings were um, completely non-operational, so this building number two and this building number four, uh, these are uh, URM buildings, so this was kind of uh, expected. And uh, I have labeled two buildings with uh, green and the red, uh, I explained them as being in, in good condition but non-operational. It's because these buildings had some visible cracks in um, both of these buildings are RC, and they had some visible cracks in uh, non-load bearing elements, also in some dilatations between different parts of buildings. So the, the hospital administration decided to evacuate them because the personnel and the patients were not feeling secure after the earthquake. But after these buildings were um, examined by, by engineers, by volunteers, they started to, to, to reuse them again. Uh, so now we are going to see a video of uh, this part of this building. This is actually the oldest building in the, the hospital complex. It's an um, unreinforced um, masonry building. It was severely damaged. Uh, as uh, as we can see here, and the Nana told you already, uh, most of the buildings uh, look actually quite good from the outside, but when you go inside, you see that the damage is very severe. This building looked um, uh, very bad even from the outside, so you automatically know that the situation is not good there. Its condition is not good. We see here wide shear cracks on uh, two stories. We see a uh, failure of cable walls, failure of chimneys. Uh, chimneys were here, up here now. You see where they are. And please please note this, this part of the building. So this is the, the, the area of the, of the hospital kitchen in the, in the basement. So we will see this part in our video now. Uh, so this is our walk through the through the ground floor, which has really thick walls. So there were no particular damage observed in the in the um, uh, structure, but there were some damage in the heating uh, utilities and water utilities. Uh, they also had some damage on the on the um, some other equipment and machines. Here we can see the the part that I told you about where the gable wall fell. Uh, fortunately, no people were present in that point in this part of the building. So uh, that was really lucky. Uh, we also made a short walk in um, 
uh, in the upper stories of the building, but, but as Nana told you, we did not feel very comfortable being there for a long time because uh, the building was very damaged and we were kind of, you know, didn't want to risk anything because of um, aftershocks that, that occurred quite often in the period. Yeah, okay, so uh, now uh, I want to take you a bit further from the epicenter. Uh, we will move for uh, around 60 kilometers uh, northwest from uh, Petrina Sisak area. We will move to uh, Zaprasic. It, it's a, it is a relatively small town uh, located near the gracious capital Zagreb. Uh, so why do we want to go there? Uh, because there were some uh, severe damage in buildings there, and these buildings were um, evacuated. Uh, we have, uh, again, uh, more details in our report, but I just want to point out some uh, key elements. Uh, I will talk about this building number four and building number two, and uh, only a sentence about this uh, URM uh, house under uh, or very close to building number four. So uh, as we can see here, building uh, uh, number four has uh, uh, six stories, seven stories, sorry. And we observed uh, very wide shear cracks on the ground floor and also crushed brick uh, on the same floor. Uh, and inside the, the building was severely damaged. So basically all the walls had severe damage uh, on the inside. Uh, and on the, uh, the left side, uh, there, there was a single family URM 10 meters away from this building. Uh, as you can see, it has no damage. So uh, we, we concluded that, that uh, the reason for that is the, the periods that got from Petrina Sisak area to, to Zaprasic. Uh, were lower and did not affect this type of, of uh, buildings, rather um, uh, multi-story URMs, because in Zaprasic, very close to these buildings, there are uh, RC multi-story family buildings, which did not have any damage at all. Uh, another example is this building number two. Again, you can see uh, significant cracks uh, shear cracks on the ground uh, level and uh, there are also severe cracks uh, throughout the building inside uh, on the staircases in the apartments basically everywhere um, the the huge cracks that appeared on the uh, top uh, story of the building are a consequence of uh, uh, basically a soft story uh, as you can see in the left picture, supported only on columns, but in this corner, there were actually no columns, so only uh, these two walls that uh, were not confined. So uh, this, uh, this behavior was kind of uh, expected. Uh, so with this, I want to finish our walk through the epicenter and the round and uh, a bit further from the epicenter. and. Now, uh, I'll pass the ball to Nenat to talk about some geotech. Yeah. Okay, so the just a quick question. Is this the latest version of the presentation? Yes, I think it is. The one I sent you online before the, okay. Yeah. Okay, yeah. and so, okay, we'll just wrap this up by a quick view of the geotech aspects. And I'll just say, you know, there's a tremendous amount of data for geotechs and geologists that uh, really is available in the field. And we were tremendously lucky uh, that uh, we had a great, you know, geotech uh, field team with us. Um, Sonia and Vedran really did a tremendous job. And you can see some of the photos like sinkholes, sinkholes under the under houses, um, pavements cracking, and there was levy damages, um, uh, liquefaction all over the place. Um, so this is in the report. And you know we're biased towards structural because of our background, but if you're interested in this, check out the report and references therein, and stay tuned for you know, um, upcoming reports on that because there's really uh, a tremendous amount of data to learn from. And um, kind of next slide. Uh, so to summarize the whole thing, uh, <clears throat> instead of me just 
repeating, you know, we saw this type of damage and the, there was widespread destruction, you know, seven people lost their lives. I thought we'd do it a bit, you know, differently. I thought we'd um, share with you one of the stories that kind of filled us with optimism, even though, um, you know, let me just tell the story. So at one of the uh, end of the longer days, we found ourselves some 15 kilometers south from Petunia in this place called the Bukovac. Um, and there was this older guy, uh, which we called Grandpa or Deda Nikola, um, who, um, you know, we went to um, evaluate his house. Um, and you can see that state in which the house is. So the guy lives in there. And, you know, we're, you know, you don't need to be an engineer to understand that this is unusable. And so we, you know, value things and, you know, click the next slide. We give him, you know, a red tag. Uh, this is the type of red tag that the Creation Center for Earthquake Engineering uh, gives out. And, and, you know, we tell him, you know, this is unusable. So here's a red tag. And he says, okay, well, come with me now because I have something for you. And, and there's a small shed right next to you know, the house where this collapsed. And, and I don't know if you can notice, but on the table, there's like a little, there's little glasses filled with this really strong liquor, which is called rakia. And, and you know, he said, well, you know, you need this. It was a long day. Um, and I, I tried this and it's one of the best rakia I've ever had. Uh, and I say this to the guy and, and I tell him, you know, can I buy some of you? Do you have some? And he literally takes like half a gallon of rakia and says, you know, take this. Uh, it's been a long day for you guys. And, you know, uh, you've helped me tremendously. And this was just uh, uh, such a heartwarming um, display of empathy from a guy uh, that, you know, literally lost almost everything. Uh, and that fills you with optimism because, um, you know, he was really proud and that he's the boss there. He told me, no, I'm the boss here and you take this and you don't pay me anything. You help me tremendously. Um, and, you know, to end this presentation, I'll just, you know, quick note to the organizers. As you said, this is a quick, quick briefing. I feel a quick, quick briefing needs a quick, quick quote. And the guy who has all the quotes is Professor Miranda. And one that he shared with us <laughs> is that earthquakes never happen at the right time. And through that for Croatia, so 2020 in Croatia, there was a major earthquake in March. The year ended with a bang, as my friend Ebony would say, with another earthquake. And on top of that, you know, there was a pandemic happening. Uh, but there's an, you know, underneath this is an opportunity for discussion exactly because of this, because we had a pandemic and uh, what better place to discuss implications of this than at the first Croatian conference for earthquake engineering that you know the University of Zagreb is preparing and for me you know just there's a really strong roster of speakers already in place I'm just going to show you here you know the U.S. Um, guys involved um, so there's Professor Jarline from Stanford Ebony the guy I mentioned uh, just a moment ago and Professor Tanglin from Texas Tech and Professor Ross Stein as well hopefully you know he accepted the invitation hope the organizers uh, you know this went through uh, and the, these guys will, don't click the slide next, don't do it. So these guys will definitely ensure that, you know, we have food for thought in the presentations and discussions, but equally important is real food. And I, you know, on the next slide, I, you know, encourage organizers to make the famous Zimska Salama, which, why is this pertinent? Because this is made in Petrinja place where the earthquake happened and this is one of the most famous Croatian salami it's called winter salami or Zimska salami it's been made there for more than 300 years and so I'll just say you know hashtag earthquake salami and um, you know just to be cool and uh, hopefully this becomes a snack that you go all guys try at one point in your lives and with this tasty note you know I just thank you all for uh, your attention if you have any questions let us know and again apologies for that you know, rough start with the technical difficulties. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ninad and Marco. Um, I want to give my compliments with regard to your speech today. I thought your use of the video was very effective because we, the audience, could get a feel for the things that you saw. I have one quick question and then I'll turn it over to Volcan for several others. I know we're getting near the end here. The one question I have is this, has to do with masonry construction. 
in the United States after the 1933 Long Beach earthquake, that gave rise to reinforced masonry construction. In your country, when is when did reinforced masonry construction come in to um, uh, be a requirement or has it? And just give a quick answer, please. Right, I would, uh, it has been made a requirement. I would point you to the report. There's an extensive description of, you know, the building code throughout the eras and which, you know, what, what building code mandated which. Uh, so you can see uh, all of that there. It, you'd put me on the spot right now. I, I don't want to say, tell you the wrong. Okay, that's fine. But, uh, I'll look in the report. I would like to now uh, conclude my portion. I'll turn the uh, platform over to our president, Vulcan. He's compiled questions, which he will ask the panel, our speakers today. Thank you. Thank you, Bruce. Thank you, Nenat. Thank you, Marco. This was an excellent, thought-provoking uh, conversation. And I was in Zagreb, I was in Croatia, and I know the people and um, how warm-hearted people they are. And uh, I love the Rakia story that's hit home for me. Uh, we have the same drink in Turkey. Um, so I got one question from Emery Martin. And the question is very interesting. As you know, there was a 5.2 magnitude 5.2 force shock a day before this 6.4 earthquake. Um, I'm modifying the question a little bit. Can you distinguish the damage between the force shock and the uh, main shock? And if you did so, if there were some damages due to the force shock, what can we do? to prevent much larger damage after that project? Can we red tag immediately the buildings or, or can we do something to prevent a uh, loss of life and loss of buildings? Yeah, well, thank you, you know, Amory, my PhD brother for, you know, the question. I, yeah, I really, um, you know, what, I'll just tell you a story from the field and this involved one of our, you know, People, Damir Lazar is the professor who is with us on the field team. So when the foreshock happened, um, uh, the you know the experience that the Croatian earthquake, um, you know, Croatian Center for Earthquake Engineering had in place in terms of organizing safety evaluation uh, was such that they were able to you know mobilize everyone really fast. There were engineers in the field um, really doing evaluations the day after the you know what now we know was a foreshock, um, and and. Specifically, Damir and um, one other colleague from Zomaya from University of Zagreb, they were in one of the buildings uh, when the main shock happened, and the building actually, you know, partially collapsed. Uh, and this was, you know, tremendously difficult. Um, and there's a number of these, um, you know, to volunteers that happened, uh, they, they got stuck in the, you know, attics and so forth. Um, so um, it, you know, it's really, you know, that's a lesson to keep in mind. You don't expect the aftershock or, you know, the main shock to happen so soon or, um, but uh, also what was a good thing, there's two things that helped in this case to, the number of casualties. First one is rather unfortunate that, you know, after the war, not too many people returned to that area, so not many people lived there. And, and then secondly, the foreshock kind of warned people, so they, you know, kind of, most of them, or a uh, large portion of them kind of moved away. So that kind of helped uh, put, uh, you know, casual, human casualties uh, down. Uh, but yeah, in terms, you know, um, as you've seen, there's a lot of URMs, and uh, that's, you know, as you guys call them, you know, future piles of rubble or if, you know, PI. So, yeah. But I do think, Thank you, you so know, much for proactively, you know, actions need to be put in place, so strategic planning and kind of um, things that uh, can help. Um, you know, mitigate uh, this problem. And specifically in the report, uh, there's a chapter eight uh, that s s uh, formulates recommendations based on our findings. And that was put together by Professor Miranda in a very um, insightful and, uh, way uh, where he outlines, you know, some of the things that could help along this path, short of just like red tagging everything or saying every URM is, you know, hazardous or stuff, because that's, you know, economically 
not not viable. So I would you know refer to chapter eight. It's really uh, I think a good discussion piece. That's a very good answer. And perhaps uh, more self evaluation by the occupants of the buildings might be necessary. You know, if the building doesn't look good, don't sleep in that building that night, most likely, right? Oh, you mean after the because we want to be, we, yeah after the uh, damage occurred because you cannot possibly visit every building at the same time. So if the building doesn't look good, probably wait outside until somebody comes up and says the building is safe. Yeah, but sometimes you know these things might not work. Like I'll tell you a personal experience. My, like my my uh, mother-in-law, my wife's mother and her father, they live in a essentially a urm in zagreb which you know looks like a urm but i tell them do not go in there and that they don't listen to me uh because you know there was a magnitude 5.5 in zagreb but 6.4 close to zagreb that place would be toast and uh you know and despite it you know looking okay so uh, it's a more difficult issue but i agree with you yeah we have uh, i don't have any Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Marco. Sorry. I just wanted to, to add that we have a lot of space uh, to, to educate uh, people about earthquakes because remember, we did not have such a big earthquake in Croatia for about 100 years. So people kind of forgot uh, the possible consequences of earthquakes. So we need to educate a lot, not only common people, but you know, engineers and politicians and policymakers as well. That's true. Um, I don't have any more questions from the... Oh, no, I have a lot of questions. It just okay. updated. <laughs> so I have one question. I, I'm sorry, my daughters are making a little bit noise here, although they were trained for so many years, but I don't know what's, what's happening now. Uh, mm -hmm. So I have one question. Were there any surprises? Were there any surprises that you observed in this earthquake damage distribution? Were there any buildings that you wouldn't think that would be damaged, was damaged? Or were there any buildings that, you know, perform much better than it should? While I'm looking through other questions. Yeah. Marco, do you want to say something? Or yeah, oh, I mean, uh, uh, gen oh, okay, sorry. My question was, were there any earthquake uh, damages that you wouldn't expect to occur that occurred? And were there any buildings performed better mm -hmm. than it should? Were there any surprises that you had? Yeah, I wanted to say that there were some surprises, but not in the um, in, in sense of uh, uh, buildings that performed good and we consider that they shouldn't. But in terms that you have uh, the same type of, of a building or, or a house um, and, and, that, and it performed bad, and then you have the same type of the structure uh, 100 meters away and it performed very good. So we observed that there were no, uh, no rules, you know, in general, URMs performed very bad, but on the other, on the other side, there were a lot of them that, are, that performed very good, very good. And, uh, and, and what we were happy about is that we saw the, you know, the, the, the on-site comparison of URMs and uh, in terms of family houses and confined masonry that performed extremely well under uh, 6.4 earthquake. So this was, this was very encouraging, encouraging for us. I don't know, Nenad, if you want to add something. Yeah, there's one, um, you know, in the report, there's a lot of uh, photos of this type of, um, well, construction where people would make a URM, so just, you know, bricks on the first story and then build on top of that, um, you know, confined masonry. And so what would happen, you know, the first story would essentially collapse and this topples over it. Uh, and this, um, you know, type of construction practice uh, uh, was, you know, surprising. For me but yet again this is learning from earthquakes and and you do learn a lot and this you know i know our time is running out but i would just say to all the people out there that are listening um 
if you get a chance to do you know reconnaissance and actually get involved in this uh, i would say this is a uh, highly useful um uh, thing to do for you know an engineer or a person that you know working in earthquake engineering um, it, it really helped me a lot uh, to understand things um, much better because you see things in field you draw you know parallels uh, and what what ultimately also helped me a lot is um, uh, you know collaborating with such you know excellent individuals and in you know uh, both in the field team but also in the virtual team because when we would send them photos they would say yeah oh look at there there may be something you know like a crack and you go there and there's a crack and, and you know really amazing stuff and so this is uh, and i hope that the report shares some of the learning that we've gained with you know the broader audience through there okay i have one more question um do you know if there are requirements for anchorage of non-structural components and if so do you know how those compare to the ones we use in asc7 right i am not aware of this um uh, that it exists um and for the most part um uh, uh, you know, in the report, we have a section on, you know, non-structural damage and contents damage. And there's, you know, and some, uh, you know, in some of the schools, like bookshelves were anchored to the ground. And that, that was great. And some of them, they weren't. So I don't think there's a systematic way uh, that this is required uh, to do, or the ceilings, for example. And that's one of the things that's, you know, like a quick fix that goes a long way. So, so I agree with you that this is something that, you know, it's worth you know, implementing. I have one question. Uh, it appeared that much of the observed damage is repairable. Are there any requirements to retrofit older buildings as part of their repair process? Uh, well, I, not that I'm aware of, but I, I do know that, you know, things are in motion and, and I, I, you know, I'm fully confident with, uh, you know, the expertise that local engineers have and combined with seismologists that uh, now when these things happen, uh, people that were really advocating and, you know, pointing to, you know, lack of seismic instrumentation to record earthquakes, uh, you know, retrofit strategies and need for, you know, for critical facilities like hospitals and schools, that this really, you know, help gain momentum and help uh, you know the you know decision makers to actually listen um to you know this you know, the people that you know are advocating for this and really uh know how to do these things so i'm fully confident um that people in the background are working on this as we speak but i do not know whether this this is probably not in place at this point though and finally can you make some comments on the social conditions as we are seeing some creek or river going through the area. Did you think that uh, soft soil conditions had a huge impact on the damages or the distribution of the damages or damage was more uniformly spread? You know, I, I can't answer that. Like, you know, the question, uh, this, you know, be good. there will be another, I, I assume, webinar where, you know, we'll have a geotech. Um, and as far as that, you know, I think it's clay all over the place. Uh, so, uh, but what I can say though is that uh, we did really talk to people and we tried to understand how did they feel, you know, the shaking. You know, we did in real life, did you feel it? And it's tremendously insightful, you know, just talking to people. And we talked in Petrina downtown, we talked in Sisak, which is 10 kilometers away, and we went to Zaptosh, which was 60 kilometers away, and kind of compared their descriptions. And it kind of did um, it provide us with really great clues in terms of, uh, you know, for example, the, the priest in the church, he told us, you know, I felt as if I went down and up, like it didn't go back. And then, you know, we said this to the group and then Dimitrios Digna said, oh yeah, that's probably why the ceiling, you know, collapsed and as Marco showed, where that contributed to that, like the vertical component. And, you know, this is the kind of things that we could uh, infer from talking to people. Having said this, I did not answer your question, but I'm sure the report has information about that. And, you know, I'm not geotech. Uh, but it wasn't, uh, it wasn't uh, obvious. My understanding, my gathering is, you didn't see obvious, uh, seems like the area, almost most of the area is under soft soil condition. 
So you didn't see especially bad areas. It didn't show up to your eye. It wasn't obvious, no, to you, right? The question was why this Zapriši thing, which is like 60 kilometers away, why that was that, you know, just uh, filtering of higher frequencies mm -hmm. and you had longer uh, period of waves there, which affected these couple of buildings, or was that some local effect there? Was it a uh, basin edge or there was a mountain, so waves are fracking? You know, this is something that we can, you know, just guess and hypothesize, so. but uh, unfortunately, I, as, at least I did not see the data that I can, you know, provide more insightful uh, answer to this. It seemed to us that the damage was mostly uniformly widespread throughout the area that we uh, visited. Great. Well, I would like to thank Nenad and Marco for giving this great uh, presentation. Um, we are all happy and we had at one point 135 people watching in live. It's an amazing uh, number and we would like to do this um, again with other earthquake topic and thank you very much for bearing with us and most of the people also stayed at the end of the uh, question session so I'm very grateful for that as well. Thank you all. Thank you.